Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Using Digital Finance to Promote Women's Economic Empowerment in Agriculture. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, <clears throat> let me orient you to the Blue Jeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to AWE's Liz Hellenberger. Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Liz Hellenberger and I am a gender specialist working on the Advancing Women's Empowerment or AWE program. Go ahead and go next, please. AWE is a five-year USA project dedicated to conducting research, creating tools, and providing technical assistance for missions and implementing partners to enhance women's empowerment and gender equality in agriculture projects. In the past, we have conducted gender and youth assessments for USAID Ghana, conducted research on gender and youth and market system programs, supported USAID labs and gender integration. Currently, we are conducting research on women's decision-making in agriculture, research on opportunities for women's empowerment and beyond production activities. Beyond production activities we define as activities in agriculture value chains outside of production, such as input services, processing, marketing, and retail sales, as well as piloting a toolkit for agriculture programs to address, address gender-based violence in their programming. Today, we'll be sharing out Oz research that we've completed in, in which we examine the conditions and pathways through which digital financial tools and services can economically empower women in agriculture and food systems, focusing in particular on beyond production activities. Next. In today's program, we're going to take you through the research methodology, findings and recommendations published in our report, Digital Finance and Women's Economic Empowerment and Beyond Production Activities in Agriculture and Food Systems. Then we'll jump into a fireside chat with our speakers, Patrick Sampeo from Chamba Pride and Emmanuel Dorman, the former chief of party from Advance 2 Project in Ghana. Then we'll go right into the Q&A, during which we'll prioritize questions for our fireside chat speakers first and then leaving time in the second half of the Q&A for questions on the report. Next. Today's, next. Today's presenters are Carolyn Average from FHI 360, Patrick Sampeo, who's the Chief Product Officer from Shamba Pride, and Emmanuel Dorman, our Senior Director from ACI VOCA and former Chief of Party for Advance 2. Next. Recently, we've published this report, um, which you can find on our AgriLinks page, Digital Finance and Women's Economic Empowerment Beyond Production Roles in Agriculture and Food Systems. Next. We had three research objectives uh, to catalog and, digital, and analyze digital financial tools and services used in agriculture food systems. We have an annex to the report that categorizes the tools we found throughout our research and flags them for potential use by implementers. So please be sure to check that out. The second objective is to examine the conditions and pathways to women's economic empowerment, which we'll be talking about today. And the third objective is to develop practical case studies on how we've used DFS to promote women's economic empowerment. Our case studies feature the work that Acre Africa and Advance 2 have undertaken in advancing women's economic empowerment through the use of digital finance, which we'll be hearing about in the fireside chat. Next. We have three key learning questions, which we've structured the report and presentation around. The first is to identify what digital financial tools and services have been used in agriculture to economically empower women. The second is, what are the limiting and enabling factors for access and use? And the third is, what are the lessons learned, best practices, and capacity for scale? Next. To answer these questions, we broke our methodology out into two phases a report in the case studies. 
For the report, the research team held focus group discussions with 22 individuals across 20 organizations, including research institutions, implementing partners, donors, and government agencies in six participant groups. The research team identified and reviewed 54 documents from USAID programs, international agriculture and development organizations, donors, private sector stakeholders, and research institutions. Case studies were developed to complement the report with practical examples of how to successfully integrate digital financial tools and services for women into agriculture and food systems programs. We held a data prioritization workshop, which narrowed down to two programs, Acre Africa, with technical assistance from Mercy Corps' AgriFin project, and the Feed the Future Ghana Agriculture Development and Value Chain Enhancement II, Advanced II project. We conducted key informant interviews with them and developed practical case studies, which will be published this week on our AgriLinks page. Next. For our report, our analysis used the Women's Economic Empowerment Conceptual Framework developed by the Center for Global Development and Data 2X, which relies on the domains of resources, agency, and achievements to map a pathway to women's economic empowerment. We tag our findings throughout the report with icons represented where the data identifies a factor that is either a resource barrier or opportunity, such as limited financial literacy, something that impacts women's agency, such as limited household bargaining, or an economic empowerment achievement, such as increased savings. We use these icons throughout the presentation as well to ground our discussion in the women's economic empowerment framework. Next. As I mentioned, our two case studies will be discussed throughout the fireside chat. Acre Africa is engaging women in offering microinsurance on agriculture production. And the Feed the Future of Ghana Advanced 2 project works through an outgrower business, outgrower business model to boost efficiencies in agriculture value chains using mobile money for the purchase of inputs and services, as well as sale of production. Next. Our case studies take users through the Mercy Corps AgriFin customer journey framework, providing practical steps along the customer engagement for boosting women's access to, use of, and benefit from digital financial tools and services. Next. Now I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Carolyn Average, to take us through the research findings and recommendations from the report. Hello, everyone. This is Carrie Average. I'm a technical director with FHI 360's Economic Participation and Environment Team leading our inclusion practice. I was very pleased to participate in this research endeavor with a few of my colleagues from both Encompass and FHI. I am excited to present to you some of our findings, and again, the report holds more to be discovered and, and processed from the evidence review that we undertook around these um, critical linkages and trying to identify the pathways specifically, as well as the tools, approaches, and techniques that could be utilized really by service providers in particular ecosystems, implementing partners, and then some guidance and, and recommendations really for those that are decision makers and funders of these types of endeavors. So while I go through some of our key findings, you'll note as we, we move through each section that these are also uh, denoted with sort of the resources, agency, and um, achievements tags. As you read the report after this event, hopefully, you'll see how that links together and the analysis that we've done and in trying to bring those to life in the case studies we'll talk about later. So our first learning question was really, what digital financial tools and services have supported economic empowerment for women in agriculture and food systems contexts? This had a number of sub-questions, but what we've discovered, we've sort of grouped together, and I'll share some of the evidence base that we are starting to, to derive from our research. Next slide, please. So I think in summary, and you may have heard this in, in some prior discussions, but yes, we have found that an evidence base exists that digital financial tools and DFS in general can provide a pathway for women's empowerment in the agriculture sector. It has, there is sufficient evidence, both in sort of, um, you know, formal literature as well as gray literature and through our research and focus group discussions that access to digital payments, digital savings, 
uh, digital credit can provide a significant um, savings in terms of women's time and, and allowing them to um, spend their time differently, including um, making investments into higher value added or other types of uh, productive activities in addition to their core functions, you know, likely as a smallholder farmer trying to move up that spectrum. And it does allow them greater control over their income and the way that that income is spent. So in the next few slides, I'm going to break these down sort of um, section by section and just give you a flavor of some of our findings. Next slide, please. So what was interesting is we, we really focused in on some of the, the key learnings and categorized them um, by these major groupings. So in general, across the board, across all studies we looked at and all of the um, you know, contributors on the focus group side and interviews, really digital financial services has a significant known impact on um, overcoming women's limitations on mobility. Mobility constraints are both physical as well as cultural um, and just what's acceptable in terms of overall movement within and outside of the community. And digital financial services really was um, a way to overcome that within the context that women were operating in. So as an example, um, we identified some very interesting um, studies that had been done in Bangladesh actually where DFS allowed a, uh, a woman, for instance, to manage the transaction and the payment flows, whereby she may send a male relative into the market to sell the product. I think in that case, it was dairy. So that's one, one sort of workaround solution. And it also just allows them to um, use their time rather than traveling, which is expensive and sometimes risky in many ways, to really focus on their core both um, personal and family responsibilities as well as their agricultural core responsibilities in that sector. With savings, you know, we, we did find that women who receive their um, income or transact and can set up savings accounts, either as sub wallets or as separate linked accounts, do tend to have more agency and control over their income because of that digital savings account. So I wanted to just reflect on a couple of interesting findings we had across the board. A lot of, just to be frank, a, a lot of the studies and evidence base that we found is Africa-centric, particularly based in Kenya. M-Pesa has been you know, uh, heavily studied, but we, we were able to source a good number of other um, uh, literature and just also implementer and, and other types of documents. So in terms of savings, I found um, some interesting examples in terms of um, savings pockets that had been created in Colombia designed for specific goals whereby women were able to increase their savings rate by 30% compared to the group that was not using those um, pockets as they're referred to. Additionally, in Uganda, uh, CARE set up a digital sub wallet program and they found uh, also very good results linking these savings accounts into digital wallets um, increased their savings much over um, uh, those of men and actually 69 percent of the women involved in those programs achieved their savings goals that were set out at the beginning of the program next slide you know i found actually the alternative credit scoring and then services that are um kind of more novel and, and unusual, um, are like crowd farming and PayGo are actually, they, they show a lot of promise. So in terms of alternative credit scoring, you know, this is used in lieu of having a more collateral based type of traditional um, credit analysis or, or credit scoring system. Women, as many of us in this uh, group know, have limited access to hard collateral and they also, um, through many of our focus group discussions, we unearthed you know, what we had expected, which is that women have less formal documentation about their identity, about their asset base. Um, it's also linked to land tenure. So in lieu of those more traditional collateral mechanisms, some of the interesting credit scoring systems that were being developed and tested uh, do hold a lot of promise and showed um, you know, good initial results. So, 
for instance, there was an interesting um, alternative psychometric type of alternative scoring system used in Peru, whereby um, people were tested for basic behaviors and, and the way that they feel about money and repayment and, and just their answers to some um, more soft questions versus harder asset-based questions to give a psychometric profile of what those borrowers might look like. And that was shown to be promising and again, allowed women access to that um, score that they were unable to attain through their more traditional assets and collateral means. We also saw um, an interesting example that's featured in the report uh, in Ethiopia, which was um, a government sponsored program that actually focused on trying to support women owned and women led businesses, micro small enterprises in trying to access credit. They used a lot of um, just transaction history, uh, airtime top-offs, and other types of means to provide this digital profile um, using Lendo EFL, I believe, to, to um, apply that in Amharic, create a digital scoring model, and actually they showed very promising results coming out of that versus those that the women that were not participating in that program. You know, again, the evidence base is, is variable. So I will just caveat that by saying that those examples of MSEs, you know, that were female owned and led were mostly not in the agricultural sector, unfortunately. So again, we, we have some evidence and research gaps to, to fill in, hopefully with the participation of everyone on this webinar. Um, you know, crowdfunding was something that I actually learned uh, a good amount about during this research activity. I wasn't as familiar with this model, but it's basically um, sort of like crowdfunding, but it's really oriented towards subscribers and investors uh, that put up money up front with particular producers. Um, and they yield sort of returns on a rolling basis, you know, between 10 and 30 percent. But then at the time of the sale of the, the crop, then the um, income is sort of distributed amongst the subscribers as well as the producer. So this has been actually developing and expanding. Uh, I believe the first was crowdfunding in Nigeria, but now we were actually able to identify 30 other uh, crowd farming types of operations across Sub-Saharan Africa. This has um, shown that it can increase women's access to credit in a less traditional sort of structure, and it's more, um, co-owning the results of that harvest and how that income is shared. It also helped women, you know, really develop a credit history after one cycle and then the next cycle, et cetera. You know, PAYGO has been around for a long time. This is probably many of you are familiar with the pay-as-you-go solar panel models or, you know, asset-based financing models that help um, women as well as um, others in households access things like electricity or water sanitation um, types of equipment, et cetera. These pay-go approaches, because uh, you are paying in installments and using digital platforms to transact, do provide a very nice linkage into digital credit scoring and also, again, have that alternative credit history that, that women really can benefit from since they, they have less access to more traditional structures. One of the findings, you know, that we will discuss later on, which I'm really excited about, um, around digital insurance is that, you know, yes, digital insurance does seem to increase women's access um, to coverage that is needed and help um, protect their income in the future. There's been some good experimentation, in, you know, around digital insurance, particularly index insurance that we'll be talking about. But unfortunately, we were not able to find um, examples of where this has been tested at market rates. So really the subsidy piece still remains. There are some interesting um, cultural um, and just contextual factors that are actually um, causing women uh, at times to opt out of insurance, uh, as well as male smallholder farmers, just because the alignment and sort of understanding of the index risk as a pool versus the individual risk is not well understood. And it is, um, it's maybe a marketing opportunity to, to reframe some of these products. So I don't want to um, be a spoiler. So we'll hold off on talking too much about um, insurance until we get to our discussion with our colleague from Acre. 
but we did find some interesting, um, you know, again, promising findings, just the subsidy and a lot of training and understanding still needs to be um, put in place for women to really uh, benefit from this type of product. Next slide, please. So, you know, digital payments, kind of the entry point, right, to digital financial services have been shown across the board to achieve all of these things. Um, freeing up women's time is number one in terms of just time use against, you know, other, other things that women have commitments and responsibilities for in addition to their business and, and livelihoods activities. So um, we also, I mentioned increased income in savings. Linking women to higher value markets and alternative forms of employment, we did see some good linkages to that. Again, we, these, um, the evidence base, as we'll learn during our research gaps uh, overview, the evidence base around the outcomes piece and the achievements of some of these things still needs to be filled in. Hopefully we'll use this opportunity during the webinar to, to galvanize everyone to start, um, you know, sending that forward and, and helping the community build up that evidence base. I wanted to just share uh, an example or two in terms of linking women to higher value markets and alternative forms of employment, since the overall focus of this was intended to be around women beyond production, as Liz had explained. So we did look, for instance, uh, in Uganda, digital wallets to transact with buyers. Um, they were able to obtain higher prices. They were able to move their goods farther and start um, trying to um, funnel that back, back in as an, a reinvestment into their core enterprise. So that was exciting. And then in, in m -Pesa study, again, m -Pesa has been very well studied um, because of the deep mobile penetration in Kenya in particular, but it was proven to help 185,000 women transition from farming into um, business occupations, both in the ag sector and then also non-farm. So those were exciting findings. In terms of um, improving control over finances and bargaining power, you know, we did find some good examples uh, across Africa and that digital payments can improve women's control over finance and also help them negotiate within the household. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting but not surprising findings is that just the overall privacy of having that, that transaction or income flow, or even if it's a remittance coming in through the digital channel, seems to provide um, just a much better, uh, more equal basis for starting discussions um, amongst household members, particularly heads of household who are male. So in terms of reducing vulnerability to environmental shocks, there is some good evidence, um, particularly in Tanzania, um, just to help with consumption smoothing, to have access to remittances that women were able to um, access through their digital channels and devices. They also, we uncovered a study that um, in Rwanda after an earthquake in 2008, you know, remittances and uh, as well as other types of funds coming in through uh, digital financial services were instrumental in sort of, again, consumption smoothing and helping um, restabilize. But unfortunately, that study revealed that that was mostly among wealthier people. So we're trying to, you know, keep digging into that, that segment of the evidence base. Next slide, please. So that's a, a summary. Again, I, um, I think when you read the report, you'll find some really interesting examples worldwide, um, as well as those that are more Africa-centric. But I think these kind of show some of what's, what's out there, what's been proven. And there are some good um, quotes, as well as some takeaways from our colleagues who are service providers, as well as implementing partners working on these critical issues on the ground, in the field, and working with women every day. And their reflections are also presented in the report. So I'll move now to learning question two. What are the limiting and enabling factors for women's access to and use of digital financial tools and services? So here we really wanted to look at um, specific levers, right? Factors that could be either inhibiting their use and or could be um, positioned as ways for interventions to be structured and designed 
to really get the higher level, deeper impact that we're, we're seeking with women's empowerment. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, I think we all are pretty aware of this. You know, women do have limited access just to devices, products, services, because of, you know, gender and social and cultural norms that exist that limit their agency and resources more broadly. Um, we, we went into this research sort of understanding that that was going to be kind of a basic point to start from, but, you know, we, we did discover that there were some good examples of overcoming some of these restrictions, barriers, and um, particularly around access through different ways and means. Next slide, please. So these are the factors. Again, I don't think many of these are surprising, but you know, we did uncover a number of examples and then some, some particular both projects as well as implementations by service providers that are really trying to address multiple of these areas at the same time, or maybe two to three of them, et cetera, to ensure that the uptake, well, first the, the design of their products and services, the way they're marketing them, and the way that the, um, the complementary wraparound training and capacity building needs to be designed is really um, happening thoughtfully. So women, for instance, digital and financial literacy, women um, as customers and users uh, of DFS do have some um, barriers in terms of both regular literacy, uh, financial literacy, and digital literacy again sort of compounding the fact that they've not has had as much access to these types of devices um, as well as sort of um, practice using them so these are intervention points that we we were able to gather good evidence on again we talked about you know when i was sharing a little bit about alternatives to collateral the access to assets piece uh, i think that digital financial services again we found some good examples where they can be used um, through alternative credit scoring or other means like psychometric assessments, et cetera, to work around the fact that women don't have as much access and sort of help jumpstart them on another path to use um, what they do have in order to, um, you know, access credit in particular. Additionally, this um, digital savings can be linked to building up that sort of collateral or savings and investment base that women can, can jumpstart from. Mobility for sure is a problem. I think, you know, this is um, really important in terms of mobility at varying levels within different contexts. Rural, urban, um, sort of household community, all sort of um, spectrums of mobility were, were assessed to the extent we could find evidence. We talked about some of these issues. I'll just skip ahead to a couple I didn't cover earlier. Trust and violence. So in a number of cases, um, we found, uh, I think it was one of the studies we looked at in Latin America, that, um, that there are perceptions that if women have access to devices and are using digital financial services, that they are doing something inherently untrustworthy um, and those perceptions are sort of built around cultural um, and gender norms in those locations. So for instance, um, one of the respondents from Uganda as well mentioned that there's a belief among some men in Uganda that women will use mobile devices to do something that they perceive as, you know, um, untrustworthy or not appropriate. Um, so they then sort of, uh, there's like a, a threat, either direct or indirect, of some type of gender-based violence that is linked to that. So we want to make sure that all of our interventions, of course, have do-no-harm strategies around them. And it'll be interesting to talk with our, our colleagues during the fireside chat and just hear how they dealt with some of those, you know, maybe unintended consequences of their interventions and whether this was uh, a factor in that. One thing we discovered particularly talking about uh, talking with some of the service providers that we interviewed was that women are not generally perceived as sort of uh, household decision makers, farmers, potential clients um, that they've, um, yeah, just in terms of perception bias that um, many service providers aren't starting with women clients first in their mind of how they're going to penetrate a market 
So we do talk a little bit about um, human-centered design and orientation towards um, trying to figure out women um, and how to segment them as a client base. We did discover, and it's featured in the report, a really interesting uh, World Bank tool that helps segment women um, in the agriculture sector into very discrete um, customer bases that could be applied um, by service providers as well as implementing partners when they're looking at how to approach women as non-monolithic but very specific segments and as market opportunities, um, not something extra they have to do but that they have to orient around and, and be aware of. I'll just end uh, with this preference for cash. Women tend to um, spend in smaller amounts. Uh, they feel that this is universally what we found. In many areas, they just trust cash more. They don't, it's free to exchange. They are familiar with it. And they don't need to kind of go through all of these steps, right, with the device, with the app, with learning how to use it to actually transact. So really, a number of the service providers we interviewed said that their real competition in the market was cash, not another service provider. So that's just good to keep in mind as we're, we're designing interventions to support women's empowerment. Next slide, please. So learning question three, these are some lessons learned and best practices, and, and how do we scale the things that we identified do work? Next slide, please. Thank you. So, you know, really what we what we noticed is that um, providers, implementers, um, those in the ecosystem, even government, for instance, and policymakers do need to take women's needs and limitations into account. It doesn't need to be extra or, um, you know, in lieu of something else, but just as part and parcel of the design of any type of intervention, really focus on how we increase agency over financial decisions and increased economic achievements, right? The outcomes of what we're, we're looking for here. Next slide, please. So just in brief, you know, what we noticed was that implementing partners as well as um, service providers use a range of approaches. Human-centered design came through many times in many different ways in terms of how to design tools and services to meet the needs of women. So we'll hear from our fireside chat colleagues a little bit about how they, they design their products appropriately and how women um, want to receive the training and understanding of, of how that relationship works around their providing input into a product that they you know, hope to be using. You know, in terms of all of the sophisticated things that we identified in terms of high-tech approaches to expand DFS access, particularly artificial intelligence, you know, computer-generated models, you know, very fancy um, types of approaches, really a number of the service providers interviewed across the spectrum and across continents said that really simple, low-tech approaches continue to really serve the needs of women well. So, for instance, there was a proliferation still of really basic SMS-based programs and apps just because that's what women know how to use, that's what they're comfortable using, and, you know, really orienting around their needs and, and what their interest is in engaging with that product and service is important. Next slide, please. I think I spoke to some of these points. I think one of the things we discovered in terms of um, sustaining use of DFS is really, um, you know, once women have taken up the product, they're interested in using it, uh, what tended to happen across the board was that they would cash out, right? So they, they weren't seeing a need or a use case to really keep that money in the digital ecosystem. And so one of the things we looked at was really bundling of services. And I think there were some, some good examples there. I think I'm going to run over time, so I won't share too many, but, um, you know, I think the bundling of services can be important in terms of linking other things women want to and need to know or to have in their digital pocket, which are pricing data, linkages to buyers, um, other things that affect their uh, agricultural as well as their regular lives, including pest, climate, et cetera, types of information. 
And in terms of networks and using trusted social ecosystems, what we found is that service providers in particular needed to install uh, or establish different multiple and multi-layered touch points for women to be able to reinforce you know, their, their confidence as well as their interest in continuing to use DFS. So uh, one example in Nepal found that they had to you know, really work with community leaders who were champions of this type of um, digital, um, sec, uh, digital financial service to get women to really um, stick with it. Next slide, please. So, you know, in summary, I think the business case needs to be well established. We found a number of places where both service providers, implementers, and funders and donors can be involved in that. I'll just say, in summary, training is recognized as an important factor for women's successful uptake. So all the products and services that we can design are great, but they need very specific training um, at the place they are uh, to really understand the benefit of, of using those products and services and making them feel comfortable and literate and fluent in using them. Next slide, please. So here's a few research gaps. I've mentioned some of them throughout this discussion. Next slide, please. These are places where we hope that uh, this community will be able to help us fill in the gaps. So what we did not find when we you know, went through all these studies and focus group discussions. Next. So we began this um, endeavor focusing on um, women's economic empowerment and beyond production activities within the ag sector. We really did not discover too many um, focus beyond production activities that were linked to DFS or using DFS to get them there. This is an area that deserves further discussion. A lack of sex disaggregated data, we hear this in a lot of presentations on women's empowerment, it is definitely an area everyone can be working on together, and there are some recommendations specific to this. Next, please. So what we found is, again, sort of the, the forward pieces around resources and agency. We found less data, for sure, on outcomes and achievements, if you look at that framework. And this is where everyone can be doing better documentation and just sharing out of cases and examples where the outcome is studied longer term and we can test and, and model that and try to contextualize it for other, other countries and contexts. Next slide, please. Next slide, Casey. I think we're stuck on this slide. So here's a summary of some recommendations. I will go through these very quickly so that we can allow time for the fireside chat as well as the Q&A that I know you all are um, peppering into the Q&A box. Next slide, please. Perfect. So we organized each of these four major recommendations um, into groupings for digital financial services providers, implementing partners, as well as USAID in terms of just, you know, sort of the evidence base and what we're finding. These are broad, but, you know, we've tried to link them back to the key findings, uh, which you'll see in the report, as well as some of the frameworks that we're looking at, um, such as the um, user journey that was mentioned earlier. So to reach women, providers really must target women and monitor their uptake and use. So looking at women as specific customers, collecting that sex, sex disaggregated data, and trying to take those segmentation exercises and, and feed them into human-centered design. Implementing partners, of course, continue to work with DFS providers, you know, um, rather than becoming an ecosystem actor, bring those ecosystem actors together to really focus on women's participation in the ag sector, as well as using DFS for other purposes. And really, um, you know, sort of the, the research gaps that remain um, may be best suited to be funded by uh, USAID or another funder or in collaboration with another development partner to really look at DFS services and tools that can be used by women in agriculture beyond production and, and help fill that gap. Next slide, please. Likely be two minutes over, sorry. Um, so we did determine that a real business case for reaching women in the ag sector needs to be developed. 
This is agriculture in, is inherently riskier than many other sectors and digital financial services providers need to understand the business case for targeting women specifically when they are moving out further into rural or other types of newer markets. Uh, IPs, implementing partners, can really help by identifying the business case for women and helping provide the data or the market entry point, right, that these uh, services providers might need to get them um, interested and in moving into this space and collaborate also on, you know, marrying technical um, support and other types of training being provided with what these services providers are, are trying to achieve. In terms of uh, USAID, in operating units and missions should encourage implementing partners to develop this business case with a CBA, a cost benefit analysis, and really promote, help those IPs promote that business case with the providers and making sure that there's time and space in their program cycle to do that. Next slide, please. So human-centered design, we're going to talk about this um, during our, our case study and fireside chat discussions, but really uh, human-centered design really needs to be based on women's specific needs in their specific context um, within that agricultural um, sort of community and how they um, live their lives as well as conduct their agricultural activities. Bundling, I mentioned, is very important and trying to make that use case really appetizing, you know, to ensure uptake and consistent usage. So implementing partners, really, we found um, less evidence where a gender lens had been used um, in terms of just uh, trying to slice the evidence base. These are, are things where um, we can be working with private sector partners, service providers, um, maybe we're addressing these through other gender-focused activities and trying to tackle some of those cultural norms is really important and um, likely beyond the um, sort of parameters of what a normal service provider, a private sector actor would be doing. Um, I think with the missions in USAID, uh, just an understanding that proper HCD, human-centered design, does take time and it does take resources. So embracing this type of design to make sure that things really um, our match to women's needs is an important consideration in programming. Next slide, last set of recommendations. Perfect. Marketing and dissemination really requires training for women. So training was something that we really focused on. Good examples are found within the report, and we'll hear more from um, our colleagues from ACRE and ADVANCE too. But really, IPs should be creating budgets with money and time for training. Um, DFS providers really need to provide, well, training and then sort of reinforcing capacity support and confidence building through the social network. That should be built into their product um, distribution and marketing plans. And USAID operating units and missions should require partners to budget um, to help support the uptake of these products. Next slide. So now we are going to, I'm excited to share that we're moving to our fireside chat with Patrick Sampao and Emmanuel Dormont. We are going to hopefully have them pop on camera, um, shift gears into a, a more structured chat, and then we will shift to Q&A. Please go ahead and thank you for joining. So go ahead, uh, participants, if you could please, I'm going to introduce each of our, our panelists here. But really, I'm trying to, you know, um, have them share with you some of their experience, how it, it reflects against some of the findings we discovered in our research. And then if you can drop all your questions into the Q&A box as we're talking, uh, Liz will help curate those questions and we will cover the first set will be sort of oriented towards these presenters. And then we can go to a broader Q&A. So I hope that works for everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome my colleagues. Um, since Emmanuel's picture is showing up bigger in my screen, I will go to a quick introduction of him first and then on to Patrick. So Emmanuel Dormont, you'll see his bio um, in the slide set that will be circulated afterwards, is a senior agricultural economist with more than 20 years of experience. He is currently a, very, a senior director for Merle Monitoring Evaluation Research and Learning at ACBI VOCA's headquarters but previously he served until 2019 as the chief of party for the 
Feed the Future Ghana Advance 2 program, so he can give us the full acronym. And he was very involved in some exciting work around working with VSLAs, supply chain actors, and others in the ecosystem using digital financial services to create um, some very strong women's empowerment outcomes. So welcome, Emmanuel. Very pleased Thank to you. have you. Great. You. And then we've got Patrick Sempao, who's patching in from Nairobi um, during primetime um, network hours. So let's hope he keeps his connection. Patrick is a senior digital product manager. He has more than 10 years of experience in agri-tech, insure tech, and mobile technology in general. He's currently the chief product officer at Shamba Pride, where he is uh, working on a hybrid inputs distribution system through digital channels, which is very exciting. But we are going to talk with him today mostly about his uh, additional work with Acre Africa, where he is a consultant uh, for digital product development and still helping to um, transition the crop product insurance um, model that they, they tested and that we'll talk about today based on their case study. So welcome, gentlemen. I would love for you to kick off if you don't mind. Actually, let's reverse engineer this. And Patrick, if you could give us maybe a two minute overview of just what, what were the challenges that you were trying to overcome and address at Acre Africa when you began seeking digital financial services solutions to addressing those challenges? Well, um, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, as you said, as, as you just said, that we definitely experienced quite a number of challenges um, as we got into trying to move or transition um, uh, crop insurance from premium model to premium model, meaning to self-sponsored models. And one of them is, of course, premium collection, where uh, smallholder farmers had never paid for this kind of product before. They were not used to using, um, let me say, gadgets to make payments to, uh, to, to a service, for example. Most of them are also experiencing DFA service, such as insurance, for the very, very first time. It was definitely very challenging to communicate, uh, number one, that they can trust this platform, that their money is going to somewhere that they can get a benefit from. We also experienced uh, a lot of challenges in product distribution, uh, where we were selling an intangible service or an intangible product. Uh, and farmers had never ever engaged with a service that they cannot feel, touch, or even see. Um, we therefore had to uh, transition that product or make it tangible, commoditize it in something they could touch. We also had a very, very big problem um, in scaling this product um, because initially we thought we could just, um, of course, sell this product uh, by reaching out to farmers one by one. We, of course, realized that we have to look for partnerships um, and various other models that we could use to reach farmers, it's very, very expensive uh, to scale a product at, you know, at micro level. And finally, we uh, also realized that um, most DFS products, such as the one that we were trying to distribute, only makes sense when you distribute at scale or when you bundle it uh, with other products. Um, there's quite many of them, but I think I'll stop there for now. Perfect, thank you. And just one follow-up question. Could you just, for the audience, explain the countries, for instance, uh, that Acre Africa was focused on in terms of the experimentation around index insurance? Yes, so these uh, this was uh, piloted uh, in Kenya, in Rwanda, and in Tanzania. And, and the reason for this was mostly because um, there exists a good uh, mobile money ecosystem, uh, number one. Number two, an agent, um, a mobile money agent distribution, uh, let me call them agent, uh, agent network was good enough for it to reach the threshold that we needed. Great, thank you. Uh, Emmanuel, over to you. Could you give us a brief overview of what, what you were trying to achieve and what challenges you were trying to overcome on Advance 2, as well as just a brief introduction to the, the project's overall mandate and how this digital financial services piece fit into that? So Advance 2, Advance actually stands for agricultural development value chain. So this was a project that tried to help smallholder farmers uh, improve their yields and sales uh, of, of maize, rice, and soybean. And this was uh, implemented mostly in Northern Ghana. 
which is a difficult terrain, um, a unimodal rainfall. Um, culturally, women are much less uh, resource endowed um, than stay in the South. So this is a very challenging area for women. The yields generally are low because they don't have access to inputs on time. They don't have access to services on time. Um, male um, commercial farmers who would uh, prepare land for smallholders generally would do it for the larger farmers first, who were the men, because it was more profitable uh, than to do it for the women who had say an acre or less than an acre of land. Um, if, if a guy was going to drive his tractor to plow an acre of land, he would rather plow 10 acres of land. So commercially, they were less attractive, um, I would say to service providers in general. They were the ones who would borrow at the highest uh, rate from uh, microfinance in the village and pay 5% uh, a month or even 10% a month sometimes because they wouldn't have access to uh, uh, formal financial services. So our goal really was to make sure that we created uh, as much as possible an equitable uh, environment to bring in these women uh, into the market, not just for them to sell their products uh, at the local level, but to make them attractive to receive services, to receive inputs and on time, and be attractive also to formal markets. Now, the advanced project um, work through what we call outdoor businesses who are generally um, relatively well-to-do uh, commercial farmers who had the capacity to, um, or excess capacity, uh, to pro to utilize their machinery to provide land preparation services. To so these, uh, we, we were looking at the whole value chain from production through to market. But our goal really was to help the smallholder from so much the big guys, but we had to work with the big farmers to reach the smallholder farmers and try to create a sustainable um, uh, business relationship that could thrive beyond us. So part of the, the project itself tried to help not just the smallholder farmers or just the women, but also the uh, commercial farmers to be more efficient. Now, if, if we help the commercial farmers or the intermediaries to use digital services, then obviously, we had to double up our effort to help the women as well because they were the ones who were most disadvantaged in the first place and they were the ones who had the biggest challenge uh, in terms of lacking access to the phones uh, even if the family had a phone it was less likely that it's the, the the women in the home who would have that phone first it's going to be the men so we had to find ways to not just bring the women into the into the production chain and into the market chain, but in, into um, making them attractive to receive either financial services, to receive uh, information on one what to plant, when to plant, and and generally it was it was I would say a lot of affirmative action to get that that done. We had to get the men to first. Of course, we appreciate and understand that this was not a competition between men and women, but it was a way of helping the women to complement what a household uh, income levels could be. If they could access resources, especially if they could um, be part of savings groups that enable them to raise loans from their own savings groups and often digitize those uh, uh, monies or use digital financial services like business using their savings and borrow from their savings it was really in the interest of the household as a whole rather than uh, just the, the, the women so that was really what we're trying to resolve to, to solve help the women to overcome their challenges but do it in a way that nobody sees it as a challenge to them but the men see it as a complement to 
Perfect. Actually, that's a great setup, Patrick, for my question to you is how how did you um, within your your sort of acre approach work on some of these basic access to technology um, issues just in terms of women in rural and agricultural communities being able to both access, use and, and control, you know, devices and what their connectivity looked like and how those power dynamics were, were being dealt with, I guess, at the household or community level. Do you have any reflections from your acre experience? Yes, um, I'll start with, first of all, mentioning that, um, cult, you know, cultural factors inhibited um, a lot of our efforts initially. Um, when we designed the product, we assumed that women and men behave the same way all over the country, or this is in Kenya and Tanzania. But we quickly realized that uptake was different. Um, for example, if I'm to use Kenya as an example, um, in Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern Kenya was different from uh, what we observed in uh, Western Kenya. We later came on to realize, uh, so we did a couple of phones, quick phone surveys so we can iterate the product. Uh, we realized that uh, women were more autonomous, they were given more autonomy uh, in Eastern and Central Kenya than they were in, um, in Western Kenya. So this is where a woman in Eastern and Central Kenya has more autonomy to spend money. Uh, they can go to a mobile money agent and load money. They can make that quick decision whether to buy a product or not. But in the Western bits of parts of Kenya, they needed to consult with their husbands or somebody within their household. Uh, they weren't really confident into buying a product they were consuming for the first time, a product they could not see and touch, ETC. So uh, we had to iterate very reason of that fact. Um, now, we also did a couple of other interventions, and this was to number one, we had to bring uh, to break down the cost of the product. Um, initially, the, the base price was about two to three dollars uh, to, you know, that was a, a sufficient amount of coverage. We came back and we had to break down that cost into four bits to um, the lowest cost of a product being um, 50 cents of a dollar. And we realized all of a sudden now this woman did not need permission or even to consult anybody to uh, to spend that 50 cents of a dollar. Um, and this meant that uh, we therefore introduced a savings uh, option, allowing them to make subsequent top-ups. After, after paying that 50 cents of a dollar, we allowed them to make subsequent top-ups uh, from 10 cents, 20 cents, 30 cents, and we made it very, very flexible. And what uh, we realized is that by taking off um, the burden of having to consult, these women, these women were now able to, you know, to buy insurance um, much faster. We observed, uh, you know, a lot of high frequency of top-ups, um, and then, and in this case, we actually women uh, surpassed the uptake of men um, uh, when we did this. When we did this iteration. Um, where, where we had gotten around 60% of men taking up the product. When we iterated to uh, breaking the product into smaller pieces or smaller units, women surpassed men by 60%. So we had 60% of women taking up this product and 40%. Um, another factor that, that um, came into play was how we messaged the product. Um, uh, initially, uh, we message this insurance product as something that uh, safeguards you uh, from making losses, sorry, from, uh, from you know, from uh, weather-related risks being weather index insurance. But then we realized um, the complexity of weather index insurance uh, was inhibitive uh, to mostly women because what they don't understand, they immediately do not trust. So then therefore, the decision for purchase was canceled right there and then. Um, we therefore then started uh, messaging it using more emotional um, um, terms such as securing your household, um, you know, securing the income of your household, uh, your husband's money, etc., etc. And, and, and at that point, we began um, observing a change in how they were responding uh, to the product. Um, other factors that we used was, of course, um, aligning the product, the insurance product, uh, with uh, basic commodities that they purchase, for example, um, inputs. So where in, we classify input as a primary product for a smallholder farmer and insurance almost as a luxury or secondary product. Therefore, we packaged the product 
um, to align with um, primary input. And I'll give a quick example. Um, the 50 cents of a dollar that I just mentioned is enough or is sufficient to cover uh, $5, which is the cost of uh, a two kilogram um, bag of maize seeds. So when we matched that and communicated that to these farmers, that if you pay 50 cents of a dollar, uh, it covers the cost you will pay or the cost you have paid to purchase a bag of seed so that then if you look, if for example, it doesn't rain, um, you get to recover uh, what you paid for the input. And it made much, much more sense to, to, to women, especially and I keep mentioning women because we observed um, all of these things uh, among women. Men were easily uptaking products and easily understand. But for women, we had to change and iterate a, a lot of things along the way. Then uh, finally was look for partners who we could bundle our product with uh, and make, um, and, 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 and of course, uh, use different route to markets. For example, we engaged um, what you would call village-based agents. Uh, we call them uh, champions at Eka Africa, that's what we call them. Um, and we had to onboard um, a majority of them being women because they sold faster. Um, other things that we observed was that women uh, are actually easy, cheap, cheaper to sell to, or rather the acquisition cost of a DFS product among women is, 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 is lower. Why? Because number one, women are already aggregated. So it means if you send um, a village-based agent to go and train, they already meet uh, you know, quite a number of women that are already meeting in groups. They meet frequently. They're already aggregated. They, then they also have a peer influence, which is not uh, the case with men. Uh, men are often uh, loners. You, if you go to sell to men, you will possibly find them, you know, in twos or threes or even or even one. But women are uh, in groups are uh, usually 10, 15 and the rest. So then uh, because of um, experiencing that, then we at that point decided to deliberately design the product to target women. And we changed the customer journey uh, uh, to also favor uh, women. Uh, one of the things that we realized is that and I think we shall discuss this somewhere along the way that the customer journey uh, of a woman is uh, a customer journey that uh, suits a man is not the same one that, that suits uh, a woman. And by customer journey, I mean if it's dialing a USSD, um, the journey that you take a man through uh, is definitely different from what, uh, sorry, the journey that responds to a man uh, is definitely different from what uh, a response to, to a woman. But I, we can speak about it more along the way. Wonderful. Yep. Thank you. And actually, just thinking about your comment about aggregation, I was going to ask you, Emmanuel, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how Advanced 2 used VSLAs, Village Savings and Loans Associations, and how that, that materialized in terms of women's engagement as well as women's economic empowerment using DFS. Right. So uh, that really was a rallying uh, point for women, I would say. Getting the women on project facilitating the formation of the village savings and loans associations for the women was a big turning point in the whole project's success, especially with empowering uh, uh, women, because that created an opportunity. It was a much better uh, uh, platform for the women to, to come together than just having a women's association. So having the, 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 the VSLAs where the women met weekly and made contributions into their own savings and they could borrow from those savings when they needed it. And then there was a share out. That really brought the women uh, together. That also created the opportunity for introducing the digital financial services to them. First, as a group, we tried to get the VSLAs to digitize their own money as a group, and then get the individual members to open mobile money uh, uh, savings, mobile money accounts, which enable them to either pay their dues, receive money, and begin to pay for services. That was really critical. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the women were less attractive to receive services first. They will receive the services, but when it's already late. And then they are the mercy of the rainfall, and then their crops were more likely to fail because they did not receive the services. But having 
the capacity to pay upfront if they needed to enable them to receive services on time. That, that had a big, uh, uh, I'll say, rippling effect on, on them. Also, being with their fellow women, not all the of course, most of the women did not have mobile phones. The VSLA leaders who would usually be a little bit more well to do are the ones who own phones. We encourage the VSLAs as, a, as groups to buy mobile phones so that everybody had their chip. Every member could have their own chip, have their own account without necessarily having their own phone, without having to go home to their husband and say, can I put my chip in your phone and check how much money you have? Right? That kind of, they, they would lose control over, over that money. But everybody having their own account, even without necessarily having a phone, um, and being able to receive money, save money, or cash out money and when they needed to, uh, and really enable them to, to buy into it. Now we had to encourage uh, the, 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 the outgoing businesses to use their, their um, either the extension staff or their, some of their staff as mobile money agents. That way the women did not have to wonder how do I cash out the money if if uh, I wanted to? So we had to work around getting agents in the communities where they could cash out money if they needed to go to the market without having to worry about how to use uh, their mobile uh, their wallet. But the VSL has really provided a great platform, not just to mobilize the women to save, borrow from their own savings to utilize financial services and to access other services, whether it was inputs or it was markets, because they could then sell without physically going to the market and receive payments. Just then you had aggregators who would have an agent pick up their produce from the, from the village and they get paid into their mobile wallet without they having to move anywhere. So that was a real big um, uh, change. But that really happened because of that collective uh, uh, VSLA women's. We started a VSLA mainly for the women. And so it was 90, 97, 98% women in the first year. I think by the third year, by the second year, there were about 10% women. By the third year, about 30% women and men had joined the VSLAs because they began to see uh, the benefits uh, to the men, but it still remained uh, predominantly. Uh, women's focused uh, thing for the project. Great, thank you. And actually, we're starting to filter in some of the Q and A in a curated fashion, and trying to group those questions together. And one of them came in: What incentives are being offered to women by DFS providers to become subscribers and/or users of these services? From your experience, you know, Patrick may be first covering multiple countries. You know, what types of incentives, I guess, were being offered for uptake? Anything direct or indirect, monetary, soft? How did you structure that? Um, allow me to use an example that we most recently um, used. Uh, we, Eka Africa recently implemented a, a blockchain-based in crop insurance, which, of course, cut the costs of uh, uh, of, of, of monitoring and, and administrating the products. Um, now, th those savings were then uh, used or plowed back into giving more value for the same product. I'll give a quick example where a farmer will get, say, um, they will pay 50 cents of a dollar and get an average of about uh, four to five dollars in coverage or, or potential compensation. We plowed back those savings to make that com potential compensation about $6. And when we were uh, designing a product to specifically uh, target women, we used this as an incentive, um, showing them for this, you get more coverage. And at the time, what we're trying to do is basically encourage uh, uptake of the product and trying to explain the farm to the women that, they, of course, they stand to get more coverage. Um, something else was um, we negotiated, uh, this is another model, we negotiated with um, an input manufacturer, which is something we're also doing at, at Chamber Pride as we speak. We negotiated with an input manufacturer who 
are accepted to give a discount uh, and we use that discount as a premium. So the farmer or the small, the woman who bought this product or a bag of seed, they bought it at the ordinary price, which is an average of about $5, but it came in with free insurance and I'm using free insurance in quotes. So what happened is they did not pay extra for insurance. We had really negotiated it with a, with a manufacturer on the other side who was um, kind enough to say, okay, I'll allow it, I'll give you a, a discount. And we used this as, a, as, 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 a, as an incentive. Um, at the time it was to buy this bag of seed because it came bundled um, with insurance. So those two are, are, are what we have um, tested and we have seen working and actually being skilled uh, being skilled as we speak at Shamba Pride, um, already setting up that, as you know, Shamba Pride is already works a lot with um, uh, input manufacturers and uh, agro dealers, informal, and those that are being, uh, you know, helped to become what we call TG shops. Um, so, so a lot is going on into, in, you know, incentivizing um, input manufacturers, helping, sorry, let, let me rephrase this making sure that uh, input manufacturers are, are aware that if you send incentivize um, women, uh, uh, you get more uptake of, of your product. And, and, and mostly because everyone can now see that women are actually, the, the, market, the, the market is actually, um, has a majority of women uptaking this product more than men. So they're willing to make those cuts or this, this, those discounts, thank you. Thank you. Any incentives that were notable that you recall, Emmanuel, from the Ghana experience for women to subscribe? I'd say we, we got some of the mobile network operators to actually sell the mobile phones to the women at virtually at cost or even below cost. Um, and to physically go to the communities and uh, carry out sensitization programs, uh, meet with them, help register them, explain how the services work uh, uh, for them. And, and sometimes they were, they, were they, they saw it beyond just the profit. If, if it was purely profit for those uh, big MNOs, then they probably wouldn't. But there was also the sense of let's, let's, let's be, socially responsible. Let's be seen not just to serve the privileged, but let's be seen to be uh, going to the underprivileged and to help bring them up. Without, you know, I mean, still with the hope that you're creating a new clientele base that eventually would grow and because that's, that's medium to long term, that for the for, for the for the women or for the smallholder farmers in the communities, just having people come in and explain to them and show them how they can, beyond just using a mobile phone to chat, they can use that to transact business um, was, I'd say, a, a good incentive. And having, especially people who have used it, having other women from other communities who have used these services to either in, increase their uh, aggregation uh, services, increase their trade, uh, and, and has been helpful to them. Come and talk to them and explain how they have moved from pure cash, because everybody still does of cash, from pure cash to a mixture of cash and, and, and DFS, and how that gives them flexibility to do business without having to move. Uh, kind of creates, um, yeah, it, it, it creates the awareness and, and some incentive. We did not really have, I would say, direct incentive uh, per se, but what we did prior to COVID, um, introducing DFS and, and generally use of mobile services helped uh, in 2020 when COVID came and things were really tough. It really became the rallying point and at that point, um, I had left the project, but the project did provide about 400 basic mobile phones to a group of all the, these uh, uh, VSLA women to enable them continue to transact business, not just financial service. So we always, we never, we never saw financial service as a standalone thing. It had to be integrated in you 
uh, paying for services, saving money, uh, receiving uh, money for products that you sell. It had to be part of your business, right? It, the mobile phone itself was part of your, uh, uh, your tools to receive weather information, uh, price, pricing information, where you should be selling, when you should be planting, when you should expect the rain. So it, it was a complete uh, uh, package. And the finance bit was, I would say, the oil, the catalyst to get everything going. So one way, one way we never looked at DFS was to look at it as a standalone product. We really looked at it as an integral part of the value chain of the market system of an individual's complete package of, uh, of, of uh, doing business. Great point. And actually, that is reflected in the report as well in terms of findings, you know, from all of the studies and interviews around bundling as being a key um, facilitator of women's uptake and making the use case for them to really um, get the most out of that digital financial service. Uh, I am going to switch to a couple other questions and try to direct them accordingly. So just um, looking at some of those that have come in, there is one about is there any evidence showing that DFS enables women in rural areas to become entrepreneurs? I will give a short answer and then request that my colleague Whitney share a little bit about the various studies that she looked at during the desk review. but. What we did find was that there's a linkage between DFS and uh, more productive investment and reinvestment. Um, there were less that directly said beyond production, women go from here and then move up and become entrepreneurs, as I recall. Whitney, would you like to give any examples or correct my findings? Let's see, we may have a microphone challenge. So let's pause on that one. But that is that is sort of the piece around um, the linkages, um, which are not directly causally statistically relevant, but it's more, we found a lot of, um, what would I call it, promising findings and linkages rather than core evidence. There just hasn't been a lot of um, study of kind of what happens to women after these programs, what happens after a project cycle, right? What happens after a DFS service provision um, pilot takes off, tracking those women over time. And so that is an evidence gap that I would just encourage everyone to think about as they're looking at their rural activities and, and sort of perpetuating that um, evidence base. This is a, just a starting point for us. So let me, I'll flip to another question and maybe um, Patrick and Emmanuel can help me answer this. Are there successful examples of men becoming allies to women in providing DFS access? I think each of you mentioned a little, uh, an example around um, convincing or changing um, mindsets about, you know, making this a win-win. I guess we heard from you, Emmanuel, on that, but Patrick, are, are there examples across the countries you've worked in of men becoming allies to women providing access? Um, yes, there are, and I'll give an example of my experience both in Kenya and uh, and in uh, Tanzania as well. And this is around agro dealers. Um, we experienced that uh, quite a number of agro dealers are, are male in both countries, and. Um, we use them as a focal point of number one um, reference point where smallholder farmers will come and ask for more information or even training on on the on, on dfs products that we were we were offering um and and these men uh, perhaps for them it was because it was really commercial that you know we're placing a product on your shelf and therefore it's an incentive for them to train women uh, but they also were cognizant of the fact, we made them cognizant of the fact that um, out of 10 customers who walk in, um, around seven or six of them are going to be women. Uh, so we use that uh, you know, to get them to see the importance of um, being inclusive in how they sell their products, especially DFS products that we as a company uh, put on their shelves. 
um, and how they relate, uh, you know, and, or how they can invest a little bit more time uh, to handhold a woman into uptake in the product um, that was on the shelf. And we observed um, this working a lot. Um, it's part of the things that are, uh, that we are actually are actually really scalable because agro, agro dealers are a focal point in distribution, even of G, uh, DFS products. So we right. just add a little bit in, in the Ghana experience, we actually had the men become big allies in a sense. We, we, we had community um, elders providing up to 1,000 acres of land for the women when they realized how much this small the women could do. And this were in blocks. So you could have a group of two, three VSLAs having 40 acres of land, which then becomes commercially attractive for anybody to want to do business with them, whether it was an input dealer, it was a service provider, it was a buyer. Um, and at this point, it was the men who controlled the resources. But when the men realized that, yes, the women could do so much with so little, but sometimes much less, uh, uh, and the men had, but could do so much, and 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 then they they began to go out of their way to really really support. So I'll say, not directly. They wouldn't say we're doing it because of DFS. Only because DFS, as part of what the women were using, has made them successful and and, and very attractive as uh, business partners. So you have the, the outgoer businesses who provide services. Suddenly saying, I want to focus on this woman first. They are reliable, they're going to pay me on time, they have the money, I know they have it. Uh, they're even willing to put a deposit up front, which they didn't have before. Uh, but all of that, like I keep saying, comes as a package. But the VS, VSLAs and DFS really was, was, I would say, the the final nail that really made a big, big, uh, big jump or big uh, impact. And, right, and the thanks. women move on to other stuff. You cannot say that just because of DFS, somebody moved from being a smallholder farmer to become a trader and an aggregator. But generally you saw that as that trend happened, those are the ones who picked up DFS faster because then the need to use that for business was greater than if I was just farming. Sure, I, I can still use it, but if I'm using it for trading, I'm using it now to communicate with people outside my town and, and talking about who needs what service and when, when can I send you a bag of maize and when do I get my money? It becomes much more attractive for as you move out of the production level to say aggregation and trade uh, for the women. So you, you, you saw that transition. That's a great point. And actually, you all will see examples in the report of where that agency piece, again, it's not the end goal, but the agency that's generated from um, confidence, fluency, using these channels um, and expanding sort of the um, spectrum of people and places that women are reaching can have these additional um, positive impacts. Again, the direct linkage um, is weak between agency even, and then beyond production. And so that's that's kind of the gap we're, we're trying to fill. But anecdotally, what Emmanuel is saying was reflected by those that we interviewed in focus groups and individually, as well as some of the studies. It just, the sort of direct evidence, you know, hardcore evidence still needs to be filled in. Um, I wanted to address, there was a question from the audience around alternative credit scoring systems and what's the buy-in or receptivity by lenders. I would say that the couple of examples that we featured in the report of studies reviewed, for instance, and interviews conducted really were um, from alternative lenders. So um, less the traditional banks or financial services providers that have more traditional credit analysis techniques and models, but rather those that were more um, FinTech or more revolutionary, um, trying to do something different as a non-bank um, financial institution or a fintech financial services provider. So they seem to be more comfortable, again, with technology being the backbone in the first place, making their loans against these types of scores. 
and trying to use that actually to create differentiation in the lending space for their products and services. It's faster, it's cheaper. They feel like these alternative methods actually provide the um, collateral substitute that they are lacking and then give them an edge, right? So it's not just you turned over your land certificate, but it's behavioral, it's um, consistency, it shows your social networks, and it also will show um, just your interest, uh, ability, and um, you know commitment to repaying loans. So that is what we found. I would say there's less, less evidence, and uh, Whitney will uh, add something into the Q&A or the chat if I've missed anything, but it was really about alternative scoring technologies and being, those being used by non-traditional lenders. And then there um, probably is um, some supporting evidence around, there were good examples, um, as Emmanuel was saying, of linking VSLAs through that digital piece into formal financial institutions and, and some interesting kind of developments around that. Um, let me, I can tell that we've run over. I think I am being asked to go ahead and close out but I wanted to first thank our esteemed panelists, Emmanuel Dorman and Patrick um, Sampao, and just say thank you for your time and your energy and your contributions to the two amazing case studies that all the participants will be reading soon. Great work, both of you, thank you so much. And then thank you all participants for being so actively engaged. I'm so sorry we couldn't cover all of the Q&A but I believe that there will be some follow-up alongside this recording and some other closeout that our colleagues want to share. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks everyone again for joining us today. Uh, just a note that you can find more information about Advancing Women's Empowerment on our AgroLinks page, which I am sharing the link to in the chat. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day.